local Walmart is in Quincy, just outside of Boston. It's a short drive away, and up until about a week or so ago, I would make a weekly trip to the huge superstore to pick up groceries and cheap stationary items for school. So after driving over, I park my car and start making my way towards the main entrance when I start hearing some jerk cat calling me from across the lot. I'm not the most beautiful girl in the world, not by any stretch, but I still get whistled and hollered at by half-drunk nobodies. I just kept walking, totally ignoring their shouts and whistles as I approached the Walmart. That's when I heard his footsteps. The guy who had been shouting at me had jogged over to the parking lot. I know that's hardly the most terrifying thing you've ever heard, but it really did have me on the verge of panic. What did he want? Why had he run all the way across the parking lot? If it was just to try and mack on me, then this guy was way more pathetic than I'd first thought. But I don't deal well with conflict, so I was dreading having to tell him to back off or whatever. He then starts calling me by this other girl's name. My name is not Allie, but... Somehow he's calling me that name and kind of talking to me like he knows me. I told him that's not my name. But he just laughed like I was joking or something. This is when I got super confused. I honestly couldn't tell if he was serious or if this was some kind of prank or dare that his friends had put him up to. When I finally told him to go away, he murmured something about seeing me around. After a few days, I realized I forgot to pick up a USB stick that I needed for college. I am literally raging with myself because I figured that the only reason I forgot in the first place was because of that weird creep in the parking lot. He seemed harmless, sure, but I have to admit to being pretty rattled from the encounter. So I rolled into the parking lot again, park my car, look around this time to make sure the same gang of dudes isn't hanging around. But like something out of a bad movie, there they are, hanging in the same spot. Only this time, as I'm looking over, I happen to make eye contact with the same dude that was bothering me. I know, I messed up. As you can guess, he comes running over in the same way he did the previous time, only this time he's distinctively more aggressive. He starts calling me Allie again, but he's now accusing me of owing someone money, like a lot of money by the sounds of it. I tell him to go screw, but... He just gets wicked mad at this point and starts cussing me out in front of everyone watching. I shouted back a little, but like I said, I don't do well with conflict. I felt myself tearing up as he roared all kinds of stuff at me about how he'll get the money out of me if it's the last thing he does. He only left me alone when, in a shaking voice, I told him I was about to call the cops. I didn't go to the Walmart for a little while. I was really freaked out by what was going on, so I thought it was best just to avoid the place and let this whole mistaken identity stuff die down. Maybe it was just a big prank, but the guy got so mad last time it really didn't seem like he was playing around. So when I'm pretty sure all is blown over, I finally decided to pluck up the courage to hit the Walmart again. If the guy is there and he gets weird, I'll just call the cops. Easy. No getting upset in front of a crowd of strangers again. I drive through the parking lot slowly this time, just making sure that the guy and his friends aren't hanging around again. Nothing. No big group of creeps with bottle and brown paper bags. I was safe. It felt so liberating to not have to look over my shoulder. I practically skipped into the store to grab more graph paper, treating myself to some cheap candy since I was in such a good mood. Still smiling, I exit the store, relieved that the whole ordeal seems to be over. I was wrong. Somehow, they had seen me driving into the lot. And there were so many of them, guys, girls, some looking angry, some looking excited at the prospect of a public whooping. I've never known fear like it in my life. All I wanted to do was run back into the Walmart and hide, but I was frozen to the spot. Hey! Where's my money? One of the girls was livid with rage, bounding towards me with her hands balled into fists. She too kept calling me Allie, 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 Allie. I hated that name so much I never wanted to hear it again. The angry girl screeched about how I was dumb to think I could get away with robbing them, how I was a thieving little rat that get what's coming to her. I tried to protest my innocence that they'd gotten the wrong person, but... All my pleas were drowned out. 
Phones were out and filming. The crowd expected this screeching monster to start hitting me at any moment. I remember just closing my eyes and waiting for the blows to land. But they didn't. Instead, a pair of strong arms threw themselves around me, pulling me away from the fray. A deep accented voice began barking at the thugs to keep away from me, how the cops had been called and were on their way. It was the Walmart security guard, this huge black guy, he'd seen the whole thing and jumped in before it was too late. He led me to the security office, away from the screaming mob, and waited with me until the cops came. I broke down almost immediately, a kind of ugly sobbing. I tried to say thank you, to tell him how grateful I was, but the words wouldn't come out. I just hugged him and he shushed me as the cops dispersed the crowd. Two state police detectives ended up visiting me at home a week or so later. They explained that the thugs in the Walmart parking lot had mistaken me for some addict who was indeed named Allie. Allie was a lady of the night and part of a drug dealing gang that had disappeared a few months prior when the detectives showed me a photo of her. I understood why they'd mistaken me for her. She was like my twin. Same brown eyes, same curly brown hair. The way she smiled even reminded me of myself. It was spooky, seeing almost my doppelganger right there in the photo. They explained that she had robbed her coke-dealing boss and absconded with a large chunk of cash, but that she's overdosed on fentanyl not long after she escaped and that's why the gang were convinced it was me. They'd not seen or heard anything of Ali when they found me, and I guess they just saw Red. I think about this Ali girl sometimes and wonder how it came to be that the trouble she caused would come to outlive her and end up hanging over my head instead. I work as part of the loss prevention team at my local Walmart. No, I'm not saying where, I don't want to lose my job, I really need the money. The incidents I'm about to tell you about actually made national news too, and with the loss prevention team being so small, this whole story could be easily traced back to me. I hate my job. Yeah, I know I said I needed it, but that doesn't mean I don't despise it. I don't like spying on people, but unfortunately that's just what the job entails. Wandering around the aisles, staring at the CCTV, watching for someone walking too fast or acting nervously, it can get really boring sometimes. Sure, there, there's a little action every now and then. Some methods tries to steal a DVD player or something. We get to play cops and robbers for like half an hour until the real police show up. But half the time it's just sad. Some young, dumb addict breaking down in our office, telling us she didn't want it to be this way. Yeah, I didn't either. No one did. That's not even half of it, too. You know how angry a lone black guy can get if he thinks I'm following him around the store. I've been called racist more times than I can remember. I'm not. I'm just trying to do the job I hate so much, but it still sucks. You really see the worst in people working in loss prevention. But the weirdest thing I ever saw while working for Walmart wasn't a junkie thief or an armed robber or anything like that. It was something else entirely. So this guy comes walking through the doors one afternoon... Nothing particularly unusual about him, nothing to give us loss prevention guys any suspicion. I take my eye off of him for a little while, patrolling the store as it was my turn to do so, instead of watching the cameras. I just sort of forget about the guy, you know? I mean, you try to take note of little details, but you do it with so many people that no one in particular stays in your mind, unless they're, like, really shady looking. I wander back around towards the meat aisle casually keeping an eye on various shoppers when I see this guy again, the normal looking dude. He's balding, has a blue shirt on, and is just standing there checking out all the steaks, chops, and cutlets sitting in the fridge units. Again, nothing unusual, but here's where it starts getting weird. As I'm walking past the dude, his head sort of snaps towards me. I remember he had light-colored eyes that looked almost empty. I said hi or whatever, just greeted the dude and this big wide smile stretches across his face. The guy had no teeth, not a single tooth remained in this guy's head, just two rows of diseased looking gums that I had to stop myself recoiling from. I just tried not to react. I felt kind of sad for him, 
Maybe he's lost his dentures or something. I wouldn't judge, you know. So I do another loop of the store, watching families to try to rein in screaming kids as impatient singletons tut in their direction. I thought about how much I want kids myself, even if they can be rascals, it's something my mind wonders too often when I'm bored on the job. But as I'm coming back towards the meat aisle, something immediately strikes me as abnormal. The blue-shirted balding guy is still looking at the meat. Only this time, he's not just, like, looking at all the meat, he's staring at it. It looked like maybe one steak in particular had caught his eye or something, they weren't darting around like they were before. This time when I walk past him, he doesn't look up, he doesn't even move. He's just frozen to the spot, staring down into the fridge units with this dead look in his eyes. I mean, I seriously don't think he even blinked, and I watched him for a good few seconds. After this guy, I didn't take my usual loop around the store. I stopped at the end of the meat aisle, watching this guy slyly out of the corner of my eye. He didn't move an inch. It was seriously like one of those street mimes. Normal people never really stand still. They fidget, shift their weight from foot to foot. This guy was honestly as still as a statue, and it was really creepy. I called it in on the radio asking a co-worker about the balding man in the meat aisle, if he was known to the loss prevention team. Came back negative. The guy I was working with that day had never seen our toothless friend before in his life. So as I'm watching the guy still listening to my buddy on the radio, the toothless man begins to reach into my meat fridge and pick up a large sirloin steak, still packed in plastic. I start feeling like an idiot. Maybe the guy just likes to take his time selecting his steak. He is toothless after all. Maybe he needs the right kind for his dentures. I don't know. Go figure. Then he brings the steak up to his nose, taking a long, deep sniff of this thing through the plastic wrapper. Now, I know this guy is obviously nuts. I know the crazy kids when I see them, and this is classic crazy. But he's still not stealing anything. He's technically not even doing anything wrong. Being a little nutty isn't exactly against the law. He then rips off the plastic wrapping, and that's my cue to step in. Only when I see what he does with the steak, I freeze in my tracks. The toothless man stuffs the raw steak into his mouth. Straining his jaws, he tried to mush that thick piece of meat up with his bare gums. I was stunned. It was literally the last thing I expected a guy with no teeth to do. I actually thought he was going to stuff it down his pants or something. I've seen shoplifters stealing weirder stuff and hiding it in weirder places. But to see him actually push that steak right past his lips and start chewing... God, it was the freakiest thing I had ever ever seen. His eyes start rolling back into their sockets. His cheeks caved in as he started trying to suck all the fluids out of the raw piece of flesh. And the noises he made. Good God if the noises he made didn't scare the life out of me. Like a kind of moaning or something like he was getting off trying to swallow that piece of raw steak whole. More and more of it being stuffed into his mouth with greedy hands. Watching him spit the meat out, panting and gasping for air, I rounded the corner of the aisle, actually terrified at this point that he would see me as the sole witness to what he had just done. I waited, having somehow managed to half freak myself out watching that weirdo doing that. He quickly escaped the meat aisle, his back to me as he walked quickly towards the main exit. I know I should have stopped him, it was my job to but we're trained to keep our distance from offenders that we deem violent or unhinged and just let the cops deal with it. However, part of me wanted to know why he did something so gross. Is that why his teeth were missing? What kind of person was he that he couldn't be trusted with his own teeth? The cops picked the guy up eventually. Turns out he was a mental patient off his meds. Old guy too. So probably lost his teeth through simple lack of care. I mean... That's what they thought the deal was. Whatever was wrong with this guy, he certainly had previous convictions for retail theft. The cop that we spoke with said it was his fourth offense, that he was likely headed to federal prison for reoffending. I wonder how a guy like that would handle prison. Anyway, I don't know if you guys will find this particular story scary, but maybe it's just gross or sad. 
a poor old guy losing his mind like that, but either way, it's definitely the weirdest thing that's ever happened to me working for Walmart. In October of 2017, I managed to land myself a part-time job at my local Walmart here in Thornton, Colorado. A fairly large suburb of Denver, Brighton, is many things. Close-knit, homely, but it's hardly the most exciting place in the world. I think that's why Halloween is one of my favorite times of year. We take the holiday pretty seriously, so the anticipation and build-up to the spookiest night in the calendar is something I really look forward to. The majority of work at Walmart during that time of year involves sorting and arranging displays for all the novelty Halloween products that are stocked during October. It was hard work, sure, but getting to mess around with all kinds of masks, costumes, and ghoulish accessories was actually really fun, even if it did cause our grumpy old supervisor to glare at us down the aisles. Halloween came and went, but I found myself kind of enjoying working at Walmart. I know that sounds crazy. The customers can be awful and the hours are pretty long, but I had grown close to my co-workers. There were even one or two that I would go so far as to call friends. So naturally, when one of the store managers asked if I wanted to extend my contract into the new year, I jumped at the chance. It would be one of the biggest mistakes of my life so far. The morning of November 1st, 2017 was a grey one. One of those mornings where the world couldn't be any less inviting... All I wanted to do was crawl back into bed and sleep away the day. But still, I dragged myself into the shower, washing away the cobwebs and preparing to face the day. I was due on from 10.30 until 6.30 that evening. I hated the longer weekday shifts. They had a tendency to drag. But the thought of getting a cup of coffee from my coworker Teresa, who happened to make the best flat white this side of the Rockies, spurred me on to make it work on time. I was right. The day dragged on so bad I thought I was going to go crazy. The part-time weekend shifts were busy, but at least the activity made the time fly. Spending hours at a time counting endless boxes of merchandise as part of some pointless make-work-stock take is enough to make your brain congeal. By the time 6pm rolled around, I was about ready to give up. With so little time left on the clock, I found myself watching the minutes roll by, wandering around the store and pretending to look busy. I saw my friend Miguel hanging around near the front desk and struck up a casual conversation with him in an effort to kill another few minutes. And that's when I saw him. I'd like to think I'm not an overly judgmental person, but this guy gave me the creeps right away. He was dressed pretty normally, a black leather jacket and reddish shirt, but... It was the man's face that drew my eyes away from Miguel and caused a nervous feeling to run through me. He was pale, almost sickly looking. His cheeks were gaunt, his eyes ringed by black circles, sunken back into their sockets. It looked like a skull with nothing but a thin layer of flesh to disguise it. Miguel must have noticed the look on my face because he too turned to look. I suppose it was for the best that I reacted that way to seeing him. I think it might have saved both our lives. When I look back on it now, it's like time kind of slowed down for a few minutes. I know that's like a super cliched thing you only find in movies, but now I think there's kind of some truth in it. I remember every little moment, every little detail of those few seconds. The way his jacket, a few sizes too big for him, looked almost silly as he reached into the inside pocket the way the polished metal of his handgun seemed to glint in the bright, artificial light of the store. I watched as the man looked around for a second or two, scanning the shop floor for his first victim, before he raised the pistol and fired. I was completely and utterly horrified. I would come to understand that there are three common reactions to a sudden rush of fear, the first two being the well-known fight-or-flight responses, but there's also one that no one ever seems to talk about total shutdown. Unfortunately, that's what I experienced as the deafening bang of the first pistol shot echoed around the building and an unsuspecting customer collapsed to the floor. The older man dragged his shopping cart down with him, the contents spilling out as he lay bleeding on the ground. I couldn't move. I was just frozen to the spot. 
I had never seen anyone shot and only ever heard a gun fired like once or twice. I felt myself trembling. But for the life of me, I couldn't bring myself to flee the horrific scene of violence unfolding before us. Thankfully, Miguel did not have the same reaction. He grabbed me by my arm, so hard it left a bruise, and dragged me behind a display of kitchen appliances to take cover from the shooter. All I could do was hang on to him and pray that the shots would stop. They didn't. Over and over again, the skull-faced man fired at staff and customers alike. I remember hearing this horrible cracking sound, like right next to us as we crouch behind the heavy appliances. I would later learn that this was the sound of the high-speed pieces of lead breaking the sound barrier as they traveled within a few inches of us. Just the thought makes me feel sick, even today. Suddenly, Miguel was pulling me by the arm again as we rushed towards one of the emergency exits that lined the shop floor. Shots were still ringing out as Miguel crashed into the metal bar that opens the door. The pop of the bullets still heard as we spilled out into the freezing Colorado night. Before us were two young children, maybe only about seven or eight years old. They were crying, asking for their dad. Those poor things had no idea what was going on, only that a bad, bad thing was happening and they couldn't find their father. We tried to comfort them for a few moments while the sound of police sirens grew louder and louder until the parking lot was awash with the blue flashing lights of cop cars and other emergency vehicles. We eventually reunited the kids with their father and he openly wept as he thanked us for finding his children. Miguel was struggling to hold back the tears, but I had completely broken down by that point. Many people had. In the aftermath of the shooting... A 48-year-old man named Scott Ostrom was arrested and charged with three counts of first-degree murder. Ostrom was handed down three life sentences for the three people he shot and killed, plus another 48 years for the other victims that were lucky enough to have survived his bullets. During the sentencing, the presiding judge said that the killer had a black and malignant heart fatally bent on spreading fear, misery, and death. It was also brought up that Ostrom's sister said that he had never been the same since trying LSD in the 80s. No other motives were given for his crimes. I quit my job at Walmart and went to therapy for a while after the shootings. I felt a lot of survivor's guilt at first, wondering why Ostrom didn't choose me for his first victim, why those other people had to suffer the way they did while people like me got to walk away unscathed but I mostly just thank God that Miguel was there to save me. Life is very precious, a fragile thing that can be snuffed out in an instant, so I try to live as full a life as I can, if only for the people who innocently shopping that day, unaware that they would never see their loved ones ever again. Last year I lost my dream job. I'm sort of a gearhead. Cars, trucks, bikes, you name it, and I'll drool over the engine. So when the local custom shop I worked for decided to close down, I was absolutely devastated. The boss man explained that business was not coming in fast enough and he was moving his operation out to the Florida coast. He said if I ever wanted to move out there, then there would be a job waiting for me. But my girlfriend was pregnant at the time, and I just couldn't afford to pack up and move at such short notice. He was an awesome guy, and I was sad to see him leave Georgia, but it wasn't nearly as depressing as the situation I was left in. Literally nowhere else in town was looking for work. Rican is kind of small, and there's not much in the way of industry here. When I was a kid, there was only about 3,000 people living here, but today there's more like 9,000 calling Rican home, so, like I said... Jobs are seriously hard to come by. But there was one place that was hiring, and it happened to be the one place that I really didn't want to work. The Recon Walmart. The interview was a breeze. I'm pretty sure the store manager just wanted to make sure I wasn't either brain dead or criminally insane before he threw the job offer at me. Sales associate. I can take apart a V8 engine and reassemble the thing with my eyes closed, but there I was. Now nothing more than a sales associate. 
By the time they gave me the navy blue waistcoat thing to wear, I was seriously regretting not taking up that job offer in Florida. Like I said, it was utterly depressing, but Christmas was on its way, so as you can imagine, I had very little choice but to just shut up and power through so I could afford presents. The last thing I wanted to do was look like a bum in front of my pregnant girlfriend. As December rolled around, I started to notice job adverts for a Walmart Santa. You know the kind. An older dude who sits in a little grotto so screaming kids can sit on his lap and present him with a list of demands. Having to work at Walmart sucked, but it could have been worse. A few months down the line, that could have been me applying for Walmart Santa. We built the little grotto out of painted cardboard, scattered fake snow around, and weaving Christmas lights around the horns of fake reindeer. I've always been a big kid when it comes to Christmas, so for a little while, working at Walmart didn't suck quite so bad. I reminded myself that before long, I'd be setting up Christmas decorations for my girlfriend and the kid. Little thoughts like that helped me get through the day. When the grotto was built and December 1st rolled around, it was time to open it up to public. I was in a kind of good mood, tired from the early morning starts, but full of Christmas spirit. Georgia isn't exactly a winter wonderland, but that's never stopped me from feeling festive. On my way to the staff locker room that morning, I passed a very grumpy-looking guy who was wandering up and down the aisles. I greeted him with a cheery, Merry Christmas, sir. It was pretty much mandatory for staff to do that, but I never had any problem with it. But all he did was scowl at me. He had the kind of face that looked like it hadn't smiled in decades, like it might crack his facial features if he even tried. I just shrugged off his rudeness. I get that some people aren't into Christmas, and I try not to hold it against them. But you can imagine my surprise when I stopped by the manager's office a short while later, only to find that same dude being given the old, moth-eaten Santa costume we kept for the yearly Christmas grotto. The same guy who looked like he didn't have a festive bone in his body, had been hired for Santa's job. I think I might have laughed if I wasn't so stunned. Walmart management makes some dumb decisions on a daily basis, but this was like a masterpiece of bad hiring. When the sour-faced old dude left the manager's office without a word of thanks, I gave my boss a look of confusion as if to say, This guy? Really? The store manager replied with something about him being willing to do the job for free, otherwise they would have hired someone a little better suited for the role. Elwin's a volunteer, he's doing this out of charity. Elwin, no wonder he was in such a terrible mood all the time, poor guy's parents gave him that dumb name. As you imagine, the guy sucked at his job. He wasn't festive or cheerful, in fact I'm pretty sure he upset a few kids whose parents soon made complaints to the management. Our manager didn't care though, as long as his costs were down he really didn't care if the fake Santa made a few bratty kids cry. But that was what really confused me. This Elwin guy obviously didn't like kids, in fact he was so bad at dealing with them that I wondered if he even had any of his own. Why would someone want to be a Walmart Santa if they hate the idea of being around kids all day? Especially if the whole thing was for literally no pay. I mean, he had the job for the entire month too, not just one or two days. Stranger things have happened though, right? But less than a week before Christmas, the Walmart Santa stopped showing up for his shifts. We panicked at first since the other fake Santa we hired wasn't willing to work any more than he was contracted. In the end, we managed to convince one of the older electrical guys to don the costume and bellow out a few ho-ho-hos. He was actually pretty good, too. A dramatic improvement on that Elwin guy, anyway. A few days later, we found out why Elwin had stopped turning up to work. It seemed like any other normal day as I wandered through the store towards the staff area when I walked inside. Something immediately struck me as wrong. A gaggle of staff members were gathered around one of the couches, all reading something off of someone's phone. I mean, that's not unusual in itself, but usually it's a bunch of people laughing at some viral video or whatever. This time, there was no laughter. Everyone just had this look of horror on their faces. They were reading a news article. The picture was of a face that we had all seen before. It was Elwin's face. It turns out Elwyn did have kids, but they had gone missing not long before. 
When the police questioned Elwyn and his family as to the whereabouts of the children, they told them their missing daughter had gone to live in South Carolina. It didn't add up. This led the police to search the family home for any clues regarding the whereabouts of the missing kids. And that's where they found them, buried in the family's back garden under just a few feet of dirt. Before their lives ended, each of the children were beaten, abused, and forced to live in a cage in the backyard. The news article went on to describe the unimaginable cruelty that both children were subjugated to before their deaths. In the aftermath, the store manager was fired, and he was found to have put hundreds of children in danger, all in an effort to save a few dollars around the holidays. It seemed like Elwyn Crocker had used the Santa job as a cover for his crimes, no one could expect someone who volunteered with children to be capable of such horrific acts of sadism. I quit my job at the Recon Walmart not long after, having saved up a little money, enough to find somewhere temporary to live in Florida while I got my job back at the custom shop. It wasn't hard to convince my girlfriend to move out of Georgia after the whole terrible series of events. In fact, she was almost as keen to move as I was. I work the custom shop now, reunited with my old boss. My girlfriend is due to give birth next month and I absolutely can't wait. I can't wait to raise my future kid, give them all the things they could possibly dream of, and make sure they never suffer the same fate as those poor, tortured Crocker kids. Ever work night shifts? I know some of you have. I've seen a few posts around here about people stuck working during the midnight hours, and they're definitely my favorite. Normal people don't really know what it's like to be wide awake when the rest of the world is sleeping peacefully. It's lonely, sure. I find it difficult to keep up with daywalker friends, and I'm pretty sure it cost me one or two girlfriends, but above all, it's weird. But due to my own dumb mistakes, it's pretty much all the work I can get. Yeah, I got a record. Not many places will take me on, let alone give me any serious responsibility. So when the local Walmart here in Nogales, Arizona offered me a position as a third shift security guard, I pretty much jumped at the chance. The pay is awesome. Well, as awesome as it's going to get for a guy with my kind of past. So I'm sat in the security office one night, trying not to pass out from boredom, having given up on trying to read this gigantic Stephen King book I got for my 30th birthday. I keep telling myself to read more, but it's tough. I didn't exactly do good in school, so I feel like I missed out on so many cool stories. Yeah, I've seen The Shining and all of that, but I get sick of people telling me how much better the book is. It makes me feel dumb for not having read it. Anyway, I'm dying of boredom, so I decide to go on a little foot patrol. Maybe grab a smoke at one of the emergency exits or something. The boss man checks the CCTV occasionally just to make sure we're not sleeping on the job, which some guys actually get fired for doing. So I get up and wandered around the store in clear view of the cameras before ducking out an exit to light up. Now, Walmart parking lots can get pretty crazy. I have seen full-on fistfights between customers over stuff as small as a parking space, I've had to chase away couples getting a little too fresh in their cars, although that can be hilarious sometimes, and it only gets weirder at night. Meth heads, drug dealers, people who have met on Craigslist selling each other weird stuff, for some reason they all choose to meet in Walmart parking lots. So as I'm lighting up, a single parked sedan catches my attention. In the deserted lot, it stuck out like a sore thumb. This old battered Ford just sat there all by itself. Oh god, what now I'm thinking, just preparing myself for whatever bout of crazy was about to unfold. I watched the car for a minute or two, seeing the driver clearly in the front seat. Not like perfectly clearly, it's almost pitch black obviously, but you know when you can see like the outline of a person in the front seat? Yeah, that. Only, he's not moving at all, he's just sat perfectly still in the middle of the parking lot. I started making little bets with myself in a game I like to call Drugs, Nookie, or Mental Illness. Pretty much every encounter I ever have during a shift can be put into one of those categories. Either they're high, horny, or just insane. Now, my first thought here was Nookie. The guy's waiting for a lady of the night, 
calling one of those dumb 1-800 numbers or just jerking it to something gross on his phone. Either way, it's nothing I'll need to call the cops for, so I just finish my smoke and head back inside. An hour or so later, the same deal occurs. My eyes are closing and I'm finding it harder and harder to stay awake, so I make one of those terrible tasting instant coffees and head out for another smoke. Only, when I get to the emergency exit and step out into the night, that same car is there, having not moved an inch. Obviously, I'm getting a little suspicious about it now, but mainly because I had no idea what it was even doing there. I can spot a deal or some shady stuff in a meetup going from like a mile away, but they tend to be over and done with kind of fast. They don't hang around in the parking lot, sat still in their driver's seat. Then it hit me. The exterior cameras. They're all night vision capable with zoom lenses. All I had to do was head back to the office and mess with the settings and I'd pretty much have a sniper's look into the interior of the car. So with the Mission Impossible theme playing in my head, I rush back to the office and start spying on the sedan. Zooming in on the car, the scene lit up by the light-sensitive cameras, I could clearly see this guy's face. Along with a big vintage mustache, the dude has sunglasses on. Sat in his car, in the middle of the night, with shades on. Hmm, this guy must have been high as a kite. So if it's anything drug-related, I'm pretty obliged to get out of the car and wave them away. No one wants the cops called on them when they have a vehicle full of something illicit or whatever, so it's an easy enough task. I wander out to the car, taking it pretty slow. Nine times out of ten as I'm approaching, the lights will turn on and the car just speeds out of the parking lot. Only this one just sits there, the guy not moving at all. I tap on the back window, only gently, and say something stern along the lines of, Hey, time to leave, buddy, this ain't a motel. Still, no movement. I turn on my torch, and I see why. I didn't take in much detail. I didn't need to. There was blood everywhere. Things that should have been inside this dude were festering on the car's floor. Little trickles of blood appearing from under his shades, where whoever had done this had apparently taken his eyes, too. I ran about as far as I could before I vomited hot coffee onto the parking lot surface. I was still retching when I called 911 from the security office. It all seems like a blur now, looking back on it, but what I saw in that car still appears before my eyes sometimes when I close them at night. It's burned into my memory and I don't think I'll ever get it out. Now, Nogales is a border town and it doesn't take the cops long to work out that the body was some kind of cartel-related incident. God knows what this poor guy had done, but he must have messed up bad enough to warrant this sort of punishment. These days, I carry a thirty-eight on the job. I've never been interested in firearms, but I feel like I should carry one now, especially when I go out into the parking lot of the Nogales Walmart, just in case I run into the guys who turn that old sedan into something that'll haunt me for the rest of my life. The scariest thing that ever happened to me was in the parking lot of the Walmart in Mount Dora, Florida. It wasn't scary because it was life-threatening or some big unresolved mystery. It's scary because it's true. It's scary because we did get answers regarding the incident that had us running from a dark parking lot on a warm summer's night almost ten years ago, and those were answers that I still swell on sometimes in my darkest of moments. Now back in 2011, I was just 17 years old, a dumb kid who cared more about smoking than getting educated. Life was good in our small, well-off Florida town. Mount Dora is kind of known for its small-town charm, being home to a handful of museums and the many antique stores that sell quaint little trinkets to tourists. But that doesn't exactly make for an exciting nightlife, and there's not much for me to do as a teenager looking for excitement. So instead of finding something productive to do, me and my friends would just cruise around in the evenings, getting stoned and wasting time talking about the band we would never end up forming. So, we're chilling in the Walmart parking lot one night, passing around a J and listening to some Zeppelin on my buddy's car stereo. 
The place is pretty much deserted, except for a few parked cars and some raccoons pillaging some nearby garbage cans. We're laughing at the little critters, watching them use their hands to rummage through torn up open trash bags, when one of the nearby cars catches my eye. It was an 87 Cadillac. That detail was always stuck with me. It was filthy, like seriously nasty, looking like the only washes it's ever gotten were from the heavy Florida rains. What's more, the inside of the Cadillac was filled with trash. Not like a few fast food wrappers on the dashboard and some junk in the trunk. I mean, like, pretty much all you could see inside the vehicle was all kinds of garbage. Legit the kind of stuff that belonged in the trash bags that the raccoons were ripping up. I wondered what kind of bum owned that thing. How they'd let all that stuff just build up and build up until their car looked more like a dumpster than a sedan. But I didn't really think any more of it, not until I saw something moving among the garbage. I told my friends, pointed over at the mobile trash can and told them something was moving around inside it. They instantly laughed, telling me I was seeing stuff and that I shouldn't smoke so much if I couldn't handle it. At the time I just laughed too, thinking that they might have been right. I mean it was late. It was dark out, and yeah, I was pretty lifted. A little time passed, enough for me to relax again, and we're arguing over whether to hit up White Castle or Arby's or something when I see it again. A pile of garbage and the rolling trash can shuffling around again. Only this time, I'm 100% sure what I saw. My eyes weren't playing tricks on me, and I didn't care if my friends saw it or not. They asked me what I was doing as I slowly opened the car door and got out. I walked quietly across the dark parking lot, slowly approaching the filthy Cadillac to peer inside. It was just a sea of junk in there. Old soda cans, newspapers, plastic bags. I still remember just how badly that thing smelled too, like old milk and rotten meat. Nothing was stirring now. The whole mess was perfectly still. I reached up and wiped a little of the grime away from the window with the sleeve of my jacket. Yeah, it was gross, but I needed to see inside. There was something hiding in that car. Something that was watching us and I needed to know what it was. Nervously, I reached up with a fist and began to lightly tap on the car's grubby window, hoping it would spook whatever it was in there into revealing itself. But still, nothing moved and nothing stirred. The only sound was the chirping of crickets and the sound of my friend rolling a car window down. Dude, it's probably rats in that thing. Get away from it. Of course it was. Of course it was rats. There I was, stoned out of my mind, freaked out about a dirty old car full of rotten food. What else would be attracted to a mess like that? What else could find its way into a locked car and scuttle her around among the trash? Feeling pretty dumb, I turned back to my buddies in the car and started to say something about maybe being a little too out of it, but their faces. I'd never see them look like that, the way they did that night. Their eyes were so big, giant white circles bored into their heads that had their hair standing on the back of their neck. They were looking behind me, at the dirty old Cadillac. I didn't want to turn. I didn't want to turn to look, but I had to. Just for a second just to see what it was. A creature with pale, scaly skin pushing its grubby claws against the window smiled back at me as I felt my guts tighten with fear. It blinked, licked its lips, and then cocked its misshapen head in my direction. I ran. I ran to the car with my buddies screaming at me to hurry. I practically dived into the passenger seat as we roared off into the night, tires screaming on the tarmac as we escaped. We were terrified, too freaked out to think about eating. With our highs totally ruined, we headed home early to sleep it off and try to forget. And the next morning I was eating breakfast watching the local news when a story came on that almost made me spit out my cereal. On the TV screen was a dirty Cadillac, the same dirty Cadillac that was filled with a pile of garbage and rotten food. The news anchor was talking about what had been found among the junk. Something that had been living amongst the trash that had caught my eye just the night before. It was a kid. Three kids, actually. Children left asleep in that car by their neglectful, addict parents. The scales I thought I saw on the one kid was actually secondary burns from where the parents had spilled hot coffee on the poor little guy. 
The news anchor explained that because of the drugs and alcohol found in the vehicle, there was little to no chance that the kids would be returned to their parents. Part of me was kind of glad for that. It got me thinking. We obsess over fictional monsters, things that lurk in the shadows, things that go bump in the night. But the things that we really should be afraid of aren't the fiends that haunt our imaginations, but the monsters we create in reality through gluttony, sloth, and indifference. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. All links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, I smell like beef. <laughs>